Welcome to the Recovery Effect Podcast with Bill Vineyard. Recovery is Bill's passion and his life's work of 30 plus years. Now it's your turn to experience the Recovery Effect, a powerful mix of recovery, spirituality, philosophy, and most importantly, living life as your true self. Now here's your host, Bill Vineyard. You know, they've always said that Alcoholics Anonymous was a program of attraction. And I used to think, who in the heck do they attract? And who would be attracted to that program? I mean, it's not like belonging to an exclusive country club or anything like that that would bring some type of self-esteem or self-glorification to it. No, Alcoholics Anonymous program is definitely not that. So who do they attract? And what makes it attractive? Well, they attract the down and out. They attract the person that can't stop drinking. They attract the person who has totally destroyed their lives and want to put it back together. And so they say AA is a program of attraction. We do not promote. It's not a program of promotion. We're not going to promote this program. We're going to attract people to this program. Now, what is the method they use to attract people to this program? What is the method they use to attract these downtrodden people who cannot quit drinking, who have lost the power of choice over to drink or not to drink. What element is involved in here in regards to attracting those kind of people to this program? Well, I believe it's the, pro- it's the element of identification. We identify with these people. We that are downtrodden and out and have lost the power of choice identify with those who also are the same way, but who have recovered from this disease. We identify with that. And once we identify with their stories, then we can identify with what happened and what it's like now. And then what we do is just try to follow in their footsteps. It's the identification that means everything to us. You know, I think that's why N.A. and A.A. never got along at first. I can remember the formative years of N.A. when the drug addicts were coming to A.A. They hadn't yet had their own program yet. I was even asked to help start an N.A. group, but... I didn't feel I was a drug addict, so I never did join. But the problem, I think, that caused this opposition between N.A. and A.A. back then, between the drug addict coming to meetings and A.A. meetings and stuff, is that the alcoholic could not identify with the drug addict, and the drug addict couldn't identify with the alcoholic. I mean, what meth head can identify with an alcoholic who just wants to sit around, get drunk, and pass out in a chair? And what alcoholic can identify with a meth addict who wants to get high, stay up all night peeking out his window. There's no identification there. Now, the recovery could quite possibly be identical, the working of the 12 steps, but the attraction would not be there because the identification isn't there. So we connect with people and and our environment, our world. We connect through identification. And if we don't identify with the person or have something in common, it's hard to be attracted to that person at least attract enough to get close to him. I remember one time years ago, I rode my Harley up to New Mexico, and I went up the mountains and stayed at a monastery for about four days. I had an extremely difficult time connecting with those monks. I had no identification with them. To me, they were strange, and I suspect to to them I was strange. But I never was able to totally identify with them, and therefore I never really connected with them. You know, you can go to any school lunchroom at noon hour and watch who sets with who. You'll see that there are people that are sitting together because they're connected through identification. It might be race-based identification. It might be age-based identification. It might be sex-based identification. But it's still identification, and through that identification, they're attracted to each other, either to get into a relationship or friendship. Even the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous states that the ex-problem drinker can win the confidence of another alcoholic in a few hours. Man, that would have saved oodles and oodles of dollars and oodles and oodles of hours with psychiatrists and treatment centers. If only they would have talked to an ex-problem drinker, probably, and followed in his path. Bill stated that even a competent psychiatrist and family find the alcoholic and drug addict unapproachable. Why do they find them unapproachable? Because they can't identify with us. And on some type of even deeper level, we don't identify with them. 
Because, you see, we identify with our own. We are a program of, of identification. I bet you there's not one alcoholic or one drug addict that hasn't felt a deep sense of loneliness and alienation from his society or his community and maybe quite possibly even his family. I've heard numerous stories of people finally getting into the doors of AA or NA and going, Whew, man, I feel home here. I feel right here. I feel I'm with my people here. Of course, the alcoholic in the attic is not alone in this alienation of this feeling of loneliness. I mean, look at our society today. Depressions has just run rapid. I bet there's a record number of medications being given for that problem. How about the porn problem? Rarely can you turn on your news and there's not somebody being arrested for child pornography. And, of course, we all know that the addiction problem is just totally skyrocketed and is out of hand. Not only have we lost the war on drugs, it's kicked our butt. Our whole society appears to just be a sad, lonely bunch of people. We are so disconnected and alienated from life and each other that we fight each other, we sue each other, we hate each other. And I think all those things like depression and, and addiction and the rest, pornography, are just ways that we're dealing with that loneliness and alienation. To paraphrase Pink Floyd, we're just all a bunch of lost souls swimming in a fishbowl year after year. How do we address that problem as a society? Well, we're striving for sameness, but we call it, we don't call it sameness. What we call it is equality. We want everybody to be equal, but in reality, we want everybody to be the same. And somehow, I guess that gives us this feeling of connectiveness to each other. But it's a false connectiveness. It has nothing to do with us not feeling alienated and alone. I think we're confused on those terms of sameness and equality. I know I've drove to my daughter's house. She just bought a new home here a few years ago, and I drive over to her house. I bet I've drove over there a hundred times. And I still have to concentrate on her house where she lives. Why is that? Because the whole neighborhood looks the same. I mean, all the roofs have to be same the same. According to the Homeowners Association, their trees have to be the same. Everything has to be the same. And if something gets out of line, they get a letter immediately and a threat that they're going to take them to court if they don't correct this and get back into the, the herd, back into the line of sameness. It's as if they're, they're attacking individuality, that people can't be their own selves. We have to be this same society. Everybody's got to be the same. And if we can do that, then we're all equal. Man, what an insane method to correct that problem of loneliness and alienation. In order to understand this, we're going to have to go through some basics here. And I hope you hang with me because I'm telling you, I really think you'll benefit a lot from this. But you're going to have to kind of concentrate on what we're talking about here so you can understand and maybe help resolve some of your alienation and loneliness and help others to do the same. So in order to lay a foundation for the answer to this problem, let's look at the hierarchy of existence of our world. The lowest on the totem pole of existence is what we call minerals, rocks. I mean, they're just rocks. They're not alive. They don't have consciousness. They don't move. They don't think. They're just rocks. They're minerals. The next one that's just a little above minerals is plants. Now, what is plants? Plants are minerals. Yes, there's minerals in plants. You can eat them and they're healthy. But also, plants have life. So you could say a plant is minerals plus life. That's plants. The reason it has life, and I know it has life because I killed a lot of them when I was trying to grow tomatoes and stuff. So they had life, and I didn't water them right or didn't take care of them right, and I extracted their life from them, and they died. So a plant is minerals plus life. The next one on this hierarchy after plants is animals. Animals have minerals. Animals, of course, have life, but animals have consciousness. A plant doesn't have consciousness. A rock doesn't have consciousness. You can knock a dog unconscious, but you can't knock a rock unconscious or a plant unconscious because a dog is conscious. It's conscious of its world to a lower degree than us humans, but it's nevertheless conscious. It knows who belongs in our yard and who doesn't. It even knows when it's time to eat. It knows where the treats are at. It's conscious of a lot of things. So you could say a, an animal, the animals, have minerals, they have life, and they have consciousness. 
Well, what comes after that? What comes after minerals, plants, animals? Well, us humans, of course. Now, what is us humans made up of? Well, we know that we have minerals. We know that we have life. And we know that we have consciousness. We're conscience. But what else is there that separates us from the animals, from the plants and minerals? What is that something that's different? Well, in my opinion, I would say that that something is spirit. Some of you might want to call it soul. But I think that that spirit separates us from the animals. The animals don't seem to have that. I have never, ever read anything that had recorded in the history of the world any animal seeking out for a higher power. Any animal getting on their knees and praying or drawing something in a cave that would help them in a hunt like humans have. We have found ancient hieroglyphics in caves of cavemen who had reached out to something greater than themselves, whether it be the sun or the moon or whatever it might be. Mankind has always reached out for something greater. There was always some type of spiritual element, some type of a spirit within man that wasn't in the rest of the entities of the world. So we could say that humans are made up of minerals, life, consciousness, and spirit. If you've been following me so far, you might want to ask the question on why do we feel so disconnected then? Why are we so alienated and lonely from everything? I mean, we're not only alienated from each other, but we seem to be alienated from nature. Why is that? Well, I think the problem started, in my opinion, back when we started disconnecting from nature. And we started viewing everything as objects separate from us. I mean, we started viewing plants as objects instead of having life like we have. We've seen a tree, let's say a walnut tree, and you look at that walnut tree and you go, man, I wonder how many coffee tables that tree could make. And if we take some grass clippings and we grind them up real fine and put it in there, I wonder if we could stretch that out till we can make almost twice as many coffee tables. So we started looking at trees and plants as objects, not as something that we can identify with, not something that we had in common with. And the same with minerals. You know, somebody looks at a rock, it's full of minerals. You think, oh, wow, I can knock that up and grind it up real fine and put it in a capsule and sell it for a vitamin. In other words, that's an object to you. In animals, we didn't see them as entities who had a lot in common with us. They had minerals and life and consciousness. We seen them as something to eat. And we should. I mean, that's what they're there for. But the point is, we looked at them as objects. We saw a cow and we thought, man, that'll make a lot of steaks. Or I can get a thousand bucks off selling that cow. We seen all these things, all these things on earth as a object as a means to an end. And of course, it was our end that they were a means to. How can they make our life better? How can they make our life richer? What can we get out of that? Thus, our thinking and our perception took a dramatic turn away from the identification with these entities, and we saw them as objects. Objects, we saw them as a means to an end. We did not see them as something we had in common with them. You know, I can remember Years ago, I bought a farm. I was going to raise organic vegetables and cows. And I had about 10 Charlay cows, and I had them artificially inseminated with this real famous bull, Charlay bull, that won some big prizes. And I bought some semen and got them artificially inseminated. I didn't do it myself, of course. I mean, I could have. No, I couldn't have. That was gross. But anyway, we got them artificially inseminated. And when it came time for them to calve, A friend of mine drove by in his truck, and he called me on the phone one morning. He said, Bill, I think that cow out there is getting ready to calve. You better put it in the barn. And I said, all right. So I go out there, and I put that cow in the barn so it can calve. Well, it didn't calve all day. And I wondered what happened. And what had happened is I put the wrong cow in the barn. The one that was getting ready to calve was out in the field, and it did calve, but it calved a dead bull, a dead baby, a dead male cow. And I don't know if it was because I didn't get it into the barn and and the, and the calf froze to death. I don't know what the reason, but I know that that calf was dead when it was born. Well, what happened is the mother stood over that calf, that dead calf, all day waiting for it to get up. And the rest of the cows went ahead and did what they do all day is just walk around, graze and eat and graze and eat. And Towards the evening time, I was standing out by a fence watching them, And the rest of the herd started walking up to this cow and this dead calf. Well, all of a sudden, this mother started hitting the 
the little dead baby with her nose trying to get the, the calf up so she could show it to the rest of the cows. Well, the calf wouldn't get up. It was dead. Well, the rest of the herd came up to that cow and it circled it about two or three times. Then it started to walk away from the cow. And it walked about 20 feet and the herd turned around and looked at that mother and then turned back and started walking. And then that mother suddenly just started walking with the rest of the herd. It was a beautiful thing to see. I could identify with that. I could identify with that mother's pain and how she desperately wanted that baby to live and how she had to accept that baby's death and walk off with the rest of the herd and start over. It was incredible. I didn't know that they were that human, that we had that much in common. In short, I connected to those cows. I no longer felt alienated from them. They were no longer objects to me. We had something in common. We had a point of identification, and I was no longer alienated, and they were an object to be used for my selfish ends. I mean, when I got the cows, there was this mother and its baby of the rancher who brought those cows to me, who sold them to me, and what he did is he left the calf but took the mother. Well, the calf wasn't weaned yet, and when he drove off in that trailer, this little calf went over to the corner of the fence and cried all night for its mother. Incredible. Just cried a screeching sound for its mother, just like a baby would if the mother leaves a room. It was at that point that I realized how disconnected I was from the world. I identified with that calf. I knew what it felt like to lose someone for them to leave you. And that calf had the same or similar feelings that I had. So we connect through identification. We're attracted through identification, and when we start disconnecting from our world, we feel that alienation and disconnectedness, and it's a lonely, sad, despairing kind of feeling. But once we start seeing things as objects, once we start seeing things as means to our end, that's the beginning of our despair, because it's the beginning of our alienation and loneliness. And the worst part is yet to come. Because once you start disconnecting from all those things, you start seeing people as objects. You start seeing people as means to an end. And what, the, what can they do for me? How can that person help me reach my goal? In other words, we don't see them as human beings. We don't see people as people that's like us, that hurt and have fears and all the things that we're going through. We see these people as nothing more as objects that's going to help us reach a goal that we have, a means to an end. I used to joke with the people in treatment when they were court-ordered there for treatment. I says, you know, you don't see me as a person. You see me as a letter, a good letter to the judge to help you stay out of jail. You don't see me as a counselor that's trying to help you or a human being that has problems also, that has fears and hurts and angers and fighting his way through life just like you are. You see me as an object an object to be used, an object to be used for your ends. Ernest Becker, in his Pulitzer Prize-winning book called The Denial of Death, said us human beings were like dinosaurs. We had teeth on one end, anus on the other, with a digestive system in the middle, and we go around devouring everything in sight, digesting it, pooping it out, and then looking for more. What a terrible description of human beings. But you know what? There is some truth to that. We forget that we're all kind of connected in this conglomeration of things. I mean, we go rocks or minerals, and you go, hey, I am too. Plants are minerals in life, and you go, hey, me too. Animals are minerals, life, and consciousness. And you, I got that. I'm with you on that. But there's no spiritual entity on this earth that we connect with. Trees or plants aren't spiritual. Of course, rocks aren't spiritual and animals aren't spiritual. So there's nothing to connect with here on this earth. Or are there? So if we're connected to rocks, minerals, because we have minerals, and if we're connected to plants because we have minerals and life, and we're connected to animals because we have minerals, life, and consciousness, then how are we connected to God? We're connected to God because God is spirit and we're spirit. And we connect to God through our spirit. We know that even the good book says God is spirit. And we have that same spirit that God has. And that's our identification point. That's what makes us identify, connect, not feel that spiritualness, that emptiness, 
that we try to find in the bottom of a bottle or in all the drugs that we're taking. Because you see, man is spirit. And if you take away a human being's spirit, you no longer have a human being. He would no longer be a human being. If you take away a man's spirit or soul, he would be no more than an animal. But for some odd reason, you can't take away human spirit. You just can't destroy mankind's spirit. I mean, think about it. Think about Kool-Aid. What makes Kool-Aid Kool-Aid? If you take away the sugar in Kool-Aid, is it still Kool-Aid? Of course it is. If you take away the color, whether it looks like strawberry or lime or lemon, whatever, if you take away the color, is it still Kool-Aid? Yes. But what if you take away the water? If you take the water away from Kool-Aid, it's no longer Kool-Aid. And if you take the spirit away from humans, they're no longer human. That is what makes a human being a human being. Consciousness doesn't make a human being a human being. It helps, but that's what makes an animal above a plant. Life doesn't make a human being a human being. That's a plant, mineral life. What makes a human being a human being is their spirit, is their soul. Without that, they're just a mineral plant or an animal. His essence is spirit. So when he needs to connect with God, he has to connect spiritually through his spirit. And the big book says that when we get well spiritually, we'll get well mentally and physically because that's the essence of humankind, spirit. Can you imagine being out there, you're an alcoholic or drug addict, and I mean, you're really in the depths of your disease. Can you imagine being out there trying to get sober and clean without his aid? Just you, just you alone, with no spiritual connection at all. Well, good luck on that. I mean, they're trying that all over the United States right now. They're trying to give them drugs or trying to do cognitive behavioral therapy. That's going to work. But you know what has succeeded the most is a spiritual program. The adoption of spiritual principles into one's life and to practice those spiritual principles in all their affairs. In other words, your spirit has connected with God's spirit and you are working a spiritual program. The moment you disconnect from that spiritual being, your higher power, you're on your way to relapse. Ask any alcoholic or drug addict who's been in the program for a while, and they'll confirm this. Because once you disconnect from this higher being, this higher power of yours, then you're alienated from the strength or from the power that you get to stay sober and clean. Man is the highest entity on earth. I mean, we are spirit. There's nothing greater than that. Life is not greater than that because life dies. You lose your life, but you never lose your spirit. That's eternal, infinite. We human beings are the highest entity on earth. I know one time my little grandson, we said he could say the prayers one night. And I think he was in the first grade or kindergarten and we all bowed our heads and he was started to pray and he said, God, thank you for making us human beings. And I thought, wow, I never thought of that. It would be terrible to be anything else but a human being. Because believe it or not, we've got that one thing that's in common with God, and that's our spirit, because he's spirit. And then once we disconnect from that, we're done. It'd be like a plant disconnected from all sunshine or all nutrients in, in, in the life, in the soil, in the air. It'd shrivel up and die. And that's what happens to us when we disconnect from the spirit. So why don't we try a little exercise? Why not, when you go through your day, why don't you, when you look at a rock, think of the minerals in that rock and think of how you have minerals in you. And likewise, do it with any plant you might see. Just look at a plant and realize it's got minerals in life, and you're, you realize that you have that in common with that plant. And the same with animals. No matter what animal it might be, you have the same thing in common. You have minerals, life, and consciousness. And if you can start doing that, then maybe you can look at other human beings and you can realize that you also have something in common with them. You have more than minerals, more than life, more than consciousness. You have the same spirit that came from the same father. But also, you also have the same feelings, the same hurts, the same fears, the same goals. Everybody wants to feel secure. Well, you want to feel secure. And look at other human beings as you'd look at yourself. They hurt. They cry. They have fears, they have joys, 
They're lonely. They're depressed. They're trying to make a living. They're insecure. I had to realize this fact when I get those stupid calls from those call centers. I mean, I was getting about three to five of them a day. And, you know, I used to kind of blow up on them or be rude to them and hang up. And then I got to thinking, you know, they're a human being just like I am. That's probably some mother over there trying to make a living for her family. And this might be the only job she could find and get. Once I started realizing that she had the same feelings and the same goals that I had in life, I started being a little kinder to them. They're all the things you are. And don't look at them as objects as means to your end. Don't look at them as objects to bring you pleasure or gratification. Look at them as you would your own brother and sister who have the same father you have. Thanks for listening to The Recovery Effect with Bill Vineyard. Check out more at therecoveryeffect.com and facebook.com slash therecoveryeffect. And don't forget to give us a five-star rating on iTunes.